Hello fellow astronauts, Chris here, and today I come to you with a treat. I'm going to show you my Cubase session for the Risk of Rain 2 console trailer. And we're gonna break it down, see what's going on behind the curtain, and how all the music is organized and all that stuff. So, without further ado, let's dive into it. Okay, so here's the session. I've zoomed out completely, so both on the horizontal and vertical plane you can see the entire thing. It's uh, about 50 tracks of music. As you can see, things are color-coded, and uh, uh, from top to bottom, my session is organized as such. I've got drums, percussion, sound effects, bass, electric guitars, pads, synths, and a couple of auxiliary tracks here and then my scents and my bosses. This is pretty typical for a Risk of Rain session. The only difference is usually I have my sound effects on the bottom here because I don't use them that much, but in this case for the trailer, they are used a lot and I wanted to have them in proximity with all the percussion and the drums because they are kind of working together. Uh, and the sound effects include, you know, like bangs and low end and some whooshes and stuff. Usually when I'm working, I'm looking at my session on this zoom level in which you can also see data in the events here. Cubase allows you to split your overview into two parts and as you can see I, I have a bunch of utility tracks here which will stick around even if I scroll my the rest of my session up or down so I can always look at them. I have my markers here which are currently empty and I've only kept my click marker because I had all my markers like resolved so to speak. I will mark down where explosions happen or things that I need to lock in with the music. And once I kind of figure it out and, and, and solve the problem, I usually remove it and my marker track is a little bit less cluttered. And finally, there's this uh, cycle marker, which uh, when I double click it, you know, my locators will just go to the proper positions for me to come here on my export dialog and export safe that I'm every time exporting the proper range. My video marker is just uh, to play back the video, nothing uh, fancy there. My tempo marker, as you can see, has a little bit of variation and all these tempo changes are not aesthetic as much as they are just there to exactly lock at the correct frame where something is happening uh, and we'll see it in the video later. My signature marker, which in this case I've kept hidden, is because it's just 4-4 all throughout. And then I have this audio track here, which used to be populated by the temp track that I got. And now it just has my click, and uh, which is uh, this thing. And it's on solo defeat, as you can see, because I want it to be included in all my exported stems. So, you know, if I solo my drums and my percussion, for example, to make a percussion stem, my click will still play back and be included in the stem. Uh, all right, so before we delve deeper into this, let's take a look uh, at the video.
Okay, so let's delve a little deeper and see what's actually going on here. As you can see, everything is divided in folders. And the exact same thing is mirrored here in the mixer. And all the drum uh, tracks, channels, will be fed into the drum bus, the percussion bus, the sound effects, bass, guitar, pad, synths, auxiliary bus, all of them. And my sense right here, which are uh, reverbs and delays uh, in this particular session, will be uh, routed to the mix bus. In the mix bus, I have my mix bus chain, which does you know some fine tuning, some compression, EQ and stuff. And then that all is sent to the master out, which has, in this particular case, just a touch of spectral shaping. Uh, just because uh, of time limitations, I don't have time to like, you know, do proper masters every time. So just a little spectral shaping will do. And uh, my limiter to just bring it to the desired level. And then my dithering plugin. In addition to all the uh, buses here, I also make use of VCA tracks, which uh, what they do if I grab my VCA here and bring it down, it will just bring up and down all the tracks that are assigned to it. And you can see here, sometimes it makes more sense to use the VCA to move things up or down. Sometimes it makes sense to use the bus. Obviously the, in, on the bus, you can have additional processing, which you can't on the VCA. It's just a fader that just tells all the faders that are assigned to, to it to move up or down, does nothing else. And that's one other reason that I'm using it because it provides me with a little bit of visual separation on my mixer. So you can see that I have this blank strip here at each VCA. So it's faster for me to see, oh, and these are my drums, and here's my next group, and my next, and my next, etc., etc. Okay, so I'll actually have the video here in the corner so we can know where we are at every given time. Let's start with our drums. Uh, very quickly, I'm just going to show you, this is my drum VST instrument, it's BFD3 from F Expansion, and I've made a custom kit that I'm using for all uh, the Risk of Rain tracks. And I'm routing a bunch of uh, kits here on separate buses within the instrument, which I'm then bringing out on Cubase so I can do additional processing if I want. Let's take a small listen. Then we have my percussion, this ensemble libraries from Heaviosity, and they have the ensemble drums, ensemble metals, woods, and ethnic, and they are kind of piercing percussion. Uh, and I like a lot this stage feature that they have, uh, for which, for example, I can just play a note and I can move it around. And the thing will remember the position. And this can make a very fast kind of uh, moving and uh, wide and nice uh, drum ensembles. Let's just play a little bit of that too. I'll add the drums. Well, let me just bring the sound effects. Play them a little bit here. So my sound effects, they are made from these gravity library from Heaviosity. And again, I'm splitting this, this, these, uh, this library includes uh, impacts, subs, whooshes, and tails. Uh, they're more or less self-explanatory what, uh, what is included here, but I just want to point out I have, you can see I have loaded my impacts twice and my wishes twice, and this one says tuned. And the, the one thing that's happening here is that I'm using, I'm using this channel just to for one particular impact. Let me just solo. And as you can see here, if you didn't, uh, weren't pay, paying attention to the knob, just check. 
I'm using some media automation to detune this hit because it has uh, a little bit of a pitch to it. And uh, on my whooshes, the difference between fast and slow is exactly what it says. So the whoosh will do like a thing. And the time that it takes to reach its peak, like from here to here, it can be adjusted in this library. So you can see here, I have it on a quarter note, it can be half or a whole note uh, or whatever, anything in between. But to avoid using a lot of automation, but still being able to quickly use the same whoosh on different positions, in the slow uh, whoosh track, I'm just using it uh, almost exclusively on the whole note. And on the other one, I might uh, use it on uh, half or smaller than that. So this is, just gives me the ability to use the exact same whoosh without having to think about, oh, did I automate it correctly to be, and, and all that stuff, you know, it just makes me work a little bit faster. Then we have our bass, which uh, it's made uh, by three tracks. And the first one, mod one, is my trusty modular here, my Eurorack. And the two other ones, they're basically two uh, instances of this mini V, the emulation of the mini Moog. Um, and the bright, it's essentially what it says. The sub is a bit lower and made more, more sine wavy. And the bright one is more so toothy and the, its filter might open up a little bit wider and stuff, but essentially uh, the one is doubling the other. Uh, then I have my guitars. It might be worth playing a little bit here. I'll just turn this off for now and I'll explain why. And the additional thing going on here, actually let me just solo it on its own and I'll play the beginning. This is an old contact library that I was using on Risk of Rain 1. And I brought it back. I've brought a lot of sounds back just to glue the two soundtracks together. So if you're familiar with the original soundtrack, you might recognize this sound. And it's just this, just a fake uh, distortion guitar. And the little clicks and stuff that you heard, that's because the the library doesn't take very kindly to tempo changes, but uh, fortunately these are uh, masked with all the mayhem, so I would not have to deal with it. You see that you don't really hear them uh, when it's playing on its own. All right, then our pads, which also include those two guitars. I'll just play them really quickly. and then a, a couple of CS80s emulations. This is a classic analog synth that Vangelis was using on Blade Runner. I'm using it a lot in the Risk of Rain 2. This is it. And finally, my Mellotron, so to speak, sound, which is, if you're familiar with Risk of Rain 1, again, I've used it a lot and I've brought it back for the new soundtrack. So it's a Mellotron together with a bit of a kind of harpsichordy, uh, arpeggiated uh, thingy. And then we go to our synths. And basically what's going on here, it's all the short stuff. For example, the, the main feature in this trailer is this, which is the monsoon motif, ostinato. And the other quite recognizable thing is my lead. And again, if you're kind of familiar with the first soundtrack, this is actually the same solo from uh, Monsoon, and I've replayed it here. And for the end, I have Gamelan, which is a sound I've introduced in this new soundtrack. And it's, it's uh, used quite heavily, but it's very atmospheric. Obviously, it's lost here, but 
Uh, you can uh, listen to it sometimes. For example, here in the beginning, I think it's uh, audible. And it's just a color thing. And last but not least, the ukulele. And for this one, let me just make the video a little bit larger and pay attention to the Huntress. You can see her holding it right now. And then I just brought it back for the golems dancing here. And to wrap the session up, I've got um, my scents here, which are made of reverbs and delays. And the first two are uh, color coded red because they're used for my drums. You see here it says DRA drum acoustic and drum electric. Actually, this one, everything is uh, uh, turned off because there's no electric drum kit in this particular session, so nothing comes through here. I could delete the track, it would be the same thing. My main reverb, uh, which I usually use this uh, instance of Ultraverb, which I just love. I just love how this sounds and it's very nice, has a lot of control you can change and stuff, and a lot of nice algorithms. Uh, my black hole reverb, which is uh, the one I my go-to reverb for very open and spacey and long and non-realistic reverbs. Then I have one here that uh, is timed, so it has a 1 16th pre-delay, which means it's tempo synced and I don't have to worry about it, deal with milliseconds and stuff. Uh, and I know that this reverb will kick in exactly a 16th after whatever signal comes through it. And then a couple of Echo Boys. The one is just a straightforward 1 16th uh, delay and the other one is a ping pong with two different settings. So it doesn't just go left and right, but it actually has a different setting for each of the uh, delays. And that's pretty much it. Maybe to wrap it up, I can take a look at what's going on on my uh, mixing chain, which is an EQ. And I'm sort of cutting off my mids here, uh, boosting a little bit, cutting a little bit of the mud here from the mid channel, and then a little bit of variety here to widen things slightly. Then my compressor, which is very uh, slight and doesn't really look at my low end, so I don't have a lot of pumping. And it's at a soft ratio. A little bit of multiband just to tame things. A little bit of saturation. Just a little bit of tape saturation. And if you notice uh, on, the, on my mid channels, even the clean tape algorithm, and again, very slight. A little bit of widening, widening on the top uh, frequencies. Just, just a touch of it. Uh, it still makes a difference, I think. And then finally, a, a kind of a loudness limiter with this. This limiter is really great, lim limiter six. You can get it for free, but also Tokyo Dawn Systems has bought this algorithm and as updated and uh, if you're looking for a limiter to like really push your mix this is the one because of, of the uh, many separate stages of limiting that go on like a compressor a peak limiter high frequency limiter a clipper and then finally like a brick wall uh, thing and finally as i've already said a touch of spectral shaping you can see it barely works when the music is playing, but it's just, it makes a difference. And um, my limiter just to bring it up to uh, proper levels. All right, so that was the session. I hope you enjoyed that overview. One thing about the video that we've been watching, I'm sure you've noticed that it wasn't the final video that went out to the public. It has a lot of placeholder arts and animatics and all that stuff. So. If you're interested in getting a little bit more into that, you can check out a video that I'm linking into the description, which is a nice featurette behind the scenes that Goldtooth has put out, and it shows the evolution of the graphics and motion capture that they did and all that nice stuff. It's really interesting. Finally, this track that we've been listening to is now uh, part of the Risk of Rain Early Access soundtrack, and there's a link in the description for that. You can go to my Bandcamp and purchase the soundtrack, 
And there are a couple of perks if you purchase it now. You get the entire soundtrack as it is right now. And once uh, new tracks come out, the soundtrack will be updated. Also, in the next content update, I'm gonna dump a lot of demos and previous versions of the music in there. And that will be exclusive to people who have bought the Early Access soundtrack. It, once the soundtrack leaves, so to speak, Early Access and it's done, I will release the proper album, which all of you who got the Early Access soundtrack will immediately get a code for it and download it for free. So if you're interested in that, again, there's a link in the description. And then if you decide to buy the album or any other album that is there, I thank you very much for it. Oh, and one last thing. Recently, I got an email from YouTube that said that uh, we, uh, this channel has reached 10,000 subscribers, which is really cool. I wasn't, I, when I made it, I was just like, I'll just have an outlet to upload my music. And now it's a small community of us and I love this very much and I love your comments. This is a great incentive to me. I know that I don't do videos too often, but if you guys let me know that, okay, we like this video, we want to see more of you, we want you to, I don't know, go more about your synths or your uh, mixing or your composing or whatever, you can leave a comment and I'll take that into account and try to make a video about it. But beyond all those things, I would just like to thank you very much for being a subscriber of this channel if you are and for just watching if you're watching casually or whatever. Uh, thank you for listening to the, and supporting my music. Uh, it's been great. I love listening from you guys. And uh, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.